But so what do we see at the end? Another look at the next few elements of what it's like when Christ returns. I call them 25 trends that are present when Christ returns that are full-blown today. What have we already covered? Not in Matthew 24. When Christ returns, there is global travel. I look, remember we went through that basically everybody traveled the same way up until the middle of the 19th century. From the time of Solomon, from the time of, of Abraham, all the way through the time of Abraham Lincoln, everyone traveled the same way. There were no advances in travel until the invention of machinery, specifically steam engines in the Industrial Revolution. So, so we covered that. When Christ returned, secondly, we saw that there's global explosion of knowledge. That it says that knowledge will increase, Daniel 12, 4, as well as people will run to and fro throughout the earth, and they do, and they never have, and knowledge has never exploded. I, I've said to you enough times you should have it memorized, that there is more information on the Sunday paper that you could have bought for a dollar fifty, or tomorrow I think you can get two for a dollar fifty if you want to save money, uh, you know, at the QTs. But um, if, if you buy one Sunday paper, there's more information in that Sunday Tulsa world than the average 16th and 17th century individual learned in their lifetime. And that's just, that's just packing material. I mean, that is nothing. With the Internet, we have, all, we have the totality of all uh, known knowledge in humanity at our fingertips, and not just knowledge, evil which is part of the equation. Thirdly, when Christ returns, there's global telecommunication and television. I went through that with you. Revelation 11, 9 and 10 and 17, 8 shows us that the, the whole world watches events. There are global events in the tribulation. Uh, someone dies in one city, everyone knows about it. Somebody is, some, the two witnesses are going around, everybody's watching them. It says in the Bible, watching them. Now that was never possible. Never possible until our generation. Then we saw that when Christ returned, there's global tracking and positioning because he's able to identify, hunt down, and track the, the Antichrist, specific individuals. That was never possible either. I mean, not with 6.2 billion people. Maybe it was when there was 250 million and most of them were inside the Roman Empire. But even then, look at uh, you know, how, how Paul writes to the runaway slave and, and to his master Philemon and tells him uh, you know, he couldn't find him. But Paul found him. But nowadays, especially with, and I, you probably know about this, that part of the U.S. government's welfare work is that there's a group of people that they have worked with in Washington, D.C. and New York City that cannot get their welfare recipients unless they take an implanted chip, kind of like they do with criminals, you know, and like animals, and like, you know, in nature, they're tracking whales and everything. Well, they're tracking people. And if they don't go outside their boundaries... They can get their welfare payments. And all of them so far have agreed to do this. And by the way, the former presidential candidate, Al Gore, is the one that proposed that, and it went through. That's, that's America tracking individuals to pay their, their government payments to them. Well, the last thing we saw and studied is this, this whole idea of with that cashless economy and digital economy. Remember, it's a number we went through all that. The last thing we saw when Christ returns, there's this weather that's gone wild, and uh, that takes us to chapter 24 because what Jesus says is, and, and I'm actually going to read it with you. We'll read as much as we can get. Uh, then Jesus, look at verse 1, went out and departed from the temple. He had just blasted the Pharisees uh, and Sadducees and religious leaders. That's chapter 23 of Matthew. And, I mean, you can just imagine he's walking out from that encounter, which was his most strident communication he ever that's recorded in the scripture i mean he he really gave it to them but he walks out from that and departs from the temple and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple which were awesome everyone that described the temple of christ day still can hardly believe how beautiful it was it was a forest of columns it was covered with gold pure white marble that just reflected the sun you put the gold sheathing over it and it was just just amazing it was blinding on a sunny day which the middle east usually is jerusalem set on a hill just was just that's why the romans wanted it there was so much so much accumulated wealth there so they wanted to show them the buildings and jesus said to them do you do you not see all these things 
Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone will be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. That was an astounding statement because the largest stones ever used in the ancient world are still part of that foundation, and the rest of it was amazing too. And for them in their minds to imagine anything that solid, that built on the bedrock, those 560 metric ton blocks, which there are no mechanical equipment today that could move. Okay, we don't have equipment that can move the blocks they moved. We're still not sure how they quite put them in. In fact, we like to in our tours have people take out their credit card and they, you can take your credit card and try and stick it between the blocks of Herod's temple and you can't get your credit card between them. And they weigh 560 metric tons. And they're so close, you can't even stick your jackknife blade between them. And so Jesus said, None of the stones are going to be left standing one upon another. Uh, and, and, of course, he wasn't talking about the foundation stones, which were underground. He was talking about there are no visible remains of, of Herod's temple left anywhere. Just what he said. Not one visible remain. They're all gone. It's swept clean. And look at verse 3. So he takes them up, and they sat on the Mount of Olives. That's why this is called, theologically, the Olivet Discourse. And the disciples came to him privately, and they said, Could you brief us on that comment you made? Uh, we would like a private explanation of those comments a prophet they want a prophetic conference tell us when these things will be what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age which is what historically believers have always asked that's why it's good to to even study this this is what paul was only three weeks in in uh, three sabbath days in the city of thessalonica and what did he cover a complete theology of christ's second coming especially of his coming for his church the rapture so this is not secondary or ancillary or peripheral. This has always been the heartbeat of the church. Expectancy of Christ's coming. Imminency of his coming. Not being ashamed when he came. The purpose of this is not for us to walk around and look at our coins and try and see if there's some kind of a, you know, a, a symbol of the Antichrist time. It's not for us to be scouring the European news to figure out if it's Solana or someone else that's going to be the beast. You know? That is not the purpose of prophecy. The purpose of prophecy is to give us a growing awareness that perhaps today Jesus Christ will come. And do we want to be found living like we're living? Or do we want to say what manner of people should we be in all holiness and godliness in our conduct, as Peter reminds us. So, he has this briefing. And Jesus answered and said to them, verse 4, Take heed that no one deceives you. Now here's the first of his descriptions. Verse 5, here's the first thing that's present when Jesus Christ returns. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. Now, they don't say, I am the Buddha, and they don't say, I am the Confucius, or I am the, you know, the whatever. He said that there would be growing numbers of false groups claiming to be the Christ, or the Christ's ones, or Christian. Now, think about that. Here's the first one. When Christ returns, there are many groups of false forms of Christianity. Stop for a minute and think. Who is the largest exporter of false Christianity in the world? Us in America. The fastest growing cults. Who went in, as soon as the wall went down, who went in and just went through all the former Soviet Union? The Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses. Just like that. Just like that. I mean, who has to serve their church for two years? The Mormons. And what church supports every one of their young people to go out on missions trips and go out there and ride their bicycles and wear their white shirts and dark pants and, and permeate the world with false Christianity? Who? The Mormons. He says, watch out. When I return, there will be many groups of false Christians. It, it, verse 11 continues. False prophets will rise up and deceive many. Numerous cults you can just look at. The, the number of exports we have of, of, I mean, we have smaller ones, Christian science and theosophy and other stuff that, that we have pumped up. But basically, America is the largest purveyor of false forms of Christianity in the world. Now, there are always isolated pockets 
of false teaching here and there around the planet. Now we have 24-7 beaming out from the Watchtower Society and from Salt Lake City and from every other cult center in the world literature, presses running around the clock, constant, televised. I mean, who has some of the most winsome ads on TV? The false Christian groups. They're so winsome. I mean, wouldn't you want to have a family like they have and happiness? And, and you just, you look, and what he says is, it's, it's not that Buddhism or Hinduism or Zoroastrianism or Mithraism, which was present in Christ's day, or Canaanite fertility cults were going to be, per- those are really not permeating the world right now. It's false Christianity. And of course, I could talk about the largest false Christianity in the world, and I will when we get further in. I shared it with the uh, discovery class and also uh, this week with someone else when I was speaking with them that 200,000 times a day Jesus Christ is said to be in a secret room because after the mass the, the body of Jesus is put into a secret room in every Roman Catholic cathedral in the world and they say Christ is in that room because they just they just through the process of the mass made the body of Christ and crucified it again and the part of it that is not consumed they take and they put in a secret room so 200,000 times a day Christ appears in a secret room wait till we get to verse 26 it's happening around the world okay there'll be there'll be groups of false teaching numerous cults have emerged in these last days religious cults are mushrooming and at the head of the pack are false Christian cults false Christian prophets okay the second thing it fascinating look what it says in verse 5 for many will come in my name saying i am the christ i want you just to think about that. that is an astounding statement for jesus to make i mean he's sitting on the side of the mount of olives and as he sat there he was looking at the buildings of jerusalem which you can still do and and he's sitting there looking there and he just says his opening line is in the future many people are going to say that they're me That's an amazing statement for Jesus, an itinerant preacher who never traveled outside the tiny nation of Israel. He had the audacity to say that many would come in his name claiming to be the Christ. Yet around the world today, I mean, we don't don't pay much attention to it in America. I mean, it doesn't make the headlines. But in the New Age movement, in the Eastern religions, in the cult, many people say that they are the promised one, the Christ. And Jesus said, the closer we get to the end, the more deceptive, the more prolific, the more global, and the more Christian they're going to be. Now wait till we get to Revelation 17. The Bible says that in the end, the most powerful form of anti-Christian propaganda is going to be a woman who portrays herself as as Christ's one on earth. Who is showing up increasingly more around the planet? The Virgin Mary. Who do the Muslims accept? The Virgin Mary. Who is calling for global peace now? Showing up everywhere. The Virgin Mary. A woman. Now she's not. We know that. We know from Lazarus that no one that's dead can come back. They just can't come back and forth and show up. No one that has died on earth is allowed to do that, except for the ones that are already chronicled in the Bible, such as the two witnesses, such as Lazarus, but he had to die again. I mean, it's not allowed to do all this showing up stuff. So we know it's not from God. So any Mary appearance on this planet is not from God. Okay, so if it's not from God, you know who it's from because God doesn't prompt that.